Okay, good morning, everyone. So, so far in this last part of the semester, we have covered immune responses to foreign things that you do want, for example, vaccination or viral infection. And then the flip side of that was immune responses to self that you don't want. And so now we're going to turn our attention to immune responses to foreign things that we do not want. And that really is allergy and hypersensitivity. Now the history of this goes back quite a long ways. So for example, King Menes from Egypt, which about ruled about 3000 BC, um, was known, <clears throat> excuse me, as the beekeeper of Egyptians. And that, that had dual meaning. It meant first the Egyptians were bees and so he's the beekeeper as the ruler. But it actually had a quite literal meaning where he went after he united upper and lower Egypt he maintained bees. So he was an actual beekeeper. And the story goes that he actually died from bee stings. And, and from the accounts that we can tell, <clears throat> this looked like a hypersensitivity reaction where he went into anaphylactic shock. It was one of the very first or earliest accounts of having a response to something that normally wouldn't kill you. Well, there are actually other examples of this. So, uh, Britannicus, who you may or may not have heard of, was the son of, of Emperor Claudius in Rome. And he had an adopted brother, Nero, that you probably have heard of. That's because Nero was the one who ascended the throne. And the reason for this was mainly because Britannicus was allergic to horses. And so it was impossible for him to lead the parades um, down the streets of Rome. And so Nero, who took his place in those, in those parades, essentially became the popular, um, the popular emperor, and then Nero ascended to the throne and had Britannicus killed. Okay, so this was an allergy that he actually used to his benefit. There's an even more striking example of King Richard III of, of, of Britain, <clears throat> and he had strawberry allergies. Okay. But he actually used this to his political advantage. When he had, would have a visiting dignitary that he disagreed with, he would intentionally consume strawberries before the dinner. And then of course he would develop an allergic reaction to those. And so when that happened, he would accuse these dignitaries of either poisoning or, or witchcraft and have them executed. So it was, it was convenient for him to use his allergies as a way to gain political power. Now, in all cases, it appears that these rulers were aware of the cause and effect of interaction with different allergens. Okay, they didn't really understand immunology. They didn't have the, the level of understanding of what those immune reactions are that you do, but they knew that if they interacted with it, it could get quite severe. Okay, so this was cause and effect for allergy before we knew anything about the immune system. Now, the first real person to describe the, um, the effects of allergy was John Bostock. And so this is in the early 1800s. He was a student of Joseph Priestley, who was studying the, the spontaneous nature of life and really was, was one of the, the first chemists or modern chemists. And so he described that hay fever happens at the same time of the year. And at, at that time, it, hay fever was just people develop these, these responses and it was seasonal. But I still didn't really know um, what that meant. They didn't understand that there, were, um, that there were causes, immunologic causes of this, that it was your own body reacting to some foreign thing. That really changed almost a hundred years later. So in the early 1900s, this was the time of Ehrlich and Pasteur and all of the early immunologists that we've talked about. And it came down to these two guys, Charles Roche and Paul Portier. Now, the story goes that they were actually kind of, uh, I wouldn't say alcoholics, but they enjoyed their wine. And so they had a bet that they could immunize dogs against uh, jellyfish hypnotoxin, okay? And what they found was that yes, they could do that, but sometimes the dogs would have immediate and fatal reactions to 
injections of the same protein. So instead of immunizing them against it, they're actually making disease worse. So we're sensitizing dogs to this jellyfish protein. And that then led to a severe uh, allergic reaction. And that really didn't take long for this to be observed in humans. And, and there's two people that really get credit for this. There's Nicholas Arthas, who you probably know from the Arthas reaction when you get tested for TB. But it also goes to Clemens von Pirquet. Okay, so he treated patients with diphtheria antitoxin. This is um, the, you know, you would, immunize, you would infect a horse and then harvest the serum from the horse. And then if a, a patient came down with diphtheria, you would treat them with horse serum. So that was passive immunization, which we talked about. But he noticed that um, some patients, if they, were, if they were either had received horse serum previously, or in some cases spontaneously, would develop severe anaphylactic symptoms when treated with horse serum. And this was particularly true in patients who had previously gotten treated with, with horse serum. And Nicholas Arthas, who observed this, as, uh, this subcutaneous swelling, really did this experimentally where he could inject horse serum into rabbits, and then he would prick their skin with uh, horse serum later and show that they had an immune reaction that didn't occur if they were not previously sensitized. And this is really the basis of TB tests, okay? So if you've had TB before, or you've had the, uh, the, uh, the vaccine for TB, they give you a, a prick of TB in your arm and they come back and monitor it uh, either a day or, or, or up to three days later. And they look for how much swelling do you have? if normal is, is not much or it goes away by three days. But if you have pre-existing antibodies to it, you get quite large swelling and that's called the Arthas reaction. Now in all of these cases, what they were talking about were that the disease caused or this anaphylactic shock that they saw was due to pre-exposure to the antigen. For the dogs, they had to have already been immunized with the jellyfish hypnotoxin. Patients had to have already been treated with horse serum, or you had to presensitize rabbits with horse serum. So this disease required pre-exposure to the antigen that then led to a more severe reaction the second time you saw antigen. And it's kind of the opposite of what we typically think about in immunology, but it can happen. Okay, so let's talk about some definitions. Hypersensitivity is when you have a pre, uh, previous exposure to an antigen, and the next time you see it, you have an enhanced immune response resulting in more, uh, more disease. Now it can be beneficial, right? As we've talked about for vaccination, you want a hypersensitivity reaction. That means it's beneficial. You have a memory response to a pathogen, and so you control it better. But it can also be harmful. And this happens, this is what we're going to talk about today, is it is the results in a hypersensitivity reaction or an allergic response to something that it really is not on its own uh, pathogenic. So for example, pollens or dust. You don't think of those as, as pathogens, but if you're allergic, you can have a hypersensitivity response to that and have quite severe disease. Now there really are four types of hypersensitivity and we'll go through the basis for all types, okay? The first three are antibody mediated, okay? So the first one is the one that we think of the most when we're talking about allergies. This is a type one response. It's IgE mediated. So it's uh, IgE bound to mast cells. And then when you encounter that antigen, the mast cells degranulate and, and you get this response typically stuffy nose, coughing, congestion. Type two is also antibody mediated, but it is IgG mediated. And so this is something that, that has gotten in systemically and then you develop an allergic response. And this is more similar to what uh, was seen with, with transfer of horse serum. And one of the most common ones is a penicillin allergy. So if you've gotten treated with penicillin before, that can alter the structures on certain proteins 
And so then you actually make an, an antibody response against yourself proteins. And then if you get penicillin again, you make a hypersensitivity response because it's modifying those proteins again. Now type three is really immune complex formation. This is where you get high levels of antibodies that actually deposit and then they cause obstruction of organs, for example, in the kidneys. And so then you have the, this uh, immune complexes, big structures of antibodies and antigen that then uh, activate the complement cascade and then you get, uh, you get a response. Now the Arthas reaction is actually this kind where it's, it is getting lots of antibodies there and activation of complement and, and hypersensitivity. The last type is type four and this is also all, often called delayed type hypersensitivity because it's T cell mediated. And so in this case, it's not antibodies that are doing the problem or making the problem, it's T cells. And the reason that it's delayed is because it takes some time for the T cells to proliferate and respond and get to the, uh, get to the, the insult or wherever the antigen is. And some examples of this is if you're allergic to um, some, if you're allergic to bee stings, for example. Now, I. I would say that, that we group these into four categories, but you can often have sort of combinations of them. You can have an IgG mediated type two uh, hypersensitivity that ultimately results in a type three or type four. So they often come together, but we'll sort of separate them out as just simplistic versions of these. So allergy really is this harmful or unwanted hypersensitivity response and typically we, we call uh, allergic reactions things that are, are hypersensitivity responses to things that are innocuous, things that don't normally hurt you. And most of the often we call, we group allergies as type one, but it often can be used for others. For example, penicillin allergy. Now there's another term that's called atopy. And um, this is really, the description, it's an older term, but it's the description of your predisposition to developing allergy. So there are things that, that cause you to be hyper, that will genetic components that cause you to be more likely to have a hypersensitivity response. But it is also environmental, right? If you have, if you live in Georgia, become allergic to things in Georgia, and then move to Seattle, you don't encounter those things, so you don't have the same uh, predisposition. Okay. You may develop new allergies to whatever's in Seattle, but it's not going to be the same allergic response. Okay, so let's go through the different types of hypersensitivity. And the first one is the most common one is type one hypersensitivity. And this is where you get a, you have some predisposition to allergies, right? And so let me get my pen here. So you have a predisposition, a genetic component here. And then there's an exposure. And this can be to some insect venom. It can be to uh, dust. It can be to a number of different proteins that are just environmental. But because of certain, because of the genetic predisposition and because of the low amount of antigen, you develop a Th2 type response, which leads to IgE. That IgE then, is made and binds to high affinity FC epsilon receptors on mast cells. And it uses those as a surrogate antigen receptor. Okay, so it's, these antibodies are already stuck on the surface of the mast cell. And the next time that you're exposed to that same allergen, then those mast cells will recognize the protein and they'll degranulate. And one of the thing, main things that they do when they degranulate is they produce histamines among other things. And I think we all are aware that histamines are the target of many of the anti-allergic medications, so-called antihistamines, which are blocking histamine receptors. So even if the mast cells degranulate, you're blocking their effects downstream. So here's a mast cell. It's got antigen, or sorry, it's got antibodies, IgE antibodies, that are bound to FC epsilon receptors on its surface. And then it's, you see that same antigen again, and the IgE on the surface of the mast cells is cross-linked. 
and that results in signaling and degranulation. Okay. Now, mast cells are actually pretty potent. They have a number of different things in them. Uh, they have enzymes, right? They have a number of enzymes that are, their goal of those enzymes is really to sort of make, the, make whatever tissue they're in easier for other cells to get to. So it's really remodeling the connective tissue. You express these enzymes or proteases primarily, and you start degrading cell-to-cell uh, -cell contact and so that there's, it's more um, accessible to other cells of the immune system. And of course, you're making things like uh, histamines and heparin. Histamines will cause smooth muscle contraction. That means that you're gonna have, uh, if it's a food allergen, you're going to have diarrhea. If it's a inhaled al allergen, you're going to have sneezing. Um, and there, there's also release of heparin. If you don't, haven't heard of heparin before, it's often used um, when you give blood so that it, it blocks clotting. And this again is so that you can have cells have an easier time getting where they need to go. Now, one of the things that, that we sort of alluded to was this genetic predisposition to allergies. And the big part of that is IL-4. Mast cells are making the first IL-4 that sort of biases all of the resulting T cell responses, right? And if you have IL-4, that's going to signal through the IL-4 receptor and result in TH2 uh, bias to your, your helper cells. Now there's a number of other things, including uh, chemokines and leukotrienes. Chemokines are proteins, leukotrienes, leukotrienes are small molecules, but they're really uh, activating molecules for other um, innate and adaptive cells. They attract them to that site. It's easier for those cells to get there because you've degraded the connective tissue and you've, you've set it up to recruit a lot of cells to wherever that, the site of that antigen is. Now there are different versions of this. And I think it's important to remember it's IgE and mast cells. So those are the main problems here. But there can be little different versions of this if it's depending on the route of the allergen. Okay, so if it's a uh, if it's a systemic thing, or for example, a injected venom, then it can be a uh, particularly if it's in the bloodstream, then the the antigen can get out from the bloodstream and activate mast cells in the tissue. Okay, so this is probably the most uh, dangerous type one response because if you have that much antigen in your system, and you're activating all of those mast cells, then you can go undergo what's called systemic anaphylaxis, right? This is a very acute and severe um, allergic response throughout the body. Now there's other versions of this. It can be uh, subcutaneous, low dose, and this is seen again with some, uh, with some uh, venoms as well as some plants. And so you get some antigen that's passing through the epithelium in the skin and you get mostly a localized response. Okay, so you don't really have systemic anaphylaxis. The one I think we're most, uh, we see most commonly, right, is inhalation where you're allergic to something that you're breathing in. That antigen is then crosses the mucosal epithelia and that causes degranulation of, of, of uh, mast cells. Now, <clears throat> the difference here really ends up being the dose, okay? So even inhalation low dose is much more than a subcutaneous injection of a low dose. So it's, it's still very severe and, and con can result in anaphylaxis, but it's not as severe as a systemic antigen. Now the last one's very similar, right? It is ingestion, this is a food allergy. And so you're taking a food allergy, if you're allergic to peanuts, um, the peanut antigen is crossing the mucosal epithelia in the digestive tract, and that's activating the mast cells. And then, of course, in both of those cases, the things that the mast cells are, are working on are the smooth muscles. They're causing smooth muscle contraction, which is otherwise known as sneezing and diarrhea, depending on the route. But in all cases, it's still IgE and mast cells. So if we talk about 
type one hypersensitivity. And, and we'll go back to John Bostock, right? Who described the seasonal nature of, of allergies. What's happening here? Well, in the first exposure, right? You don't, if you move to a new area, you typically don't have allergies the first year you live there. It's, that's the sensitization phase where you're actually making a response the first year. It's the second year when you have a problem. Okay, so you have some pollen or something that you're exposed to. That allergen is then, um, is then going to activate both B cells and T cells, just like we've talked about before. B cells are going to be activated on follicular dendritic cells. T cells are going to be activated on, excuse me, dendritic cells in the, in the lymph nodes. And from that T cell, for a variety of reasons, that T cell is predisposed to a Th2 phenotype. It's a low dose of antigen. There's not, uh, if you think about what you're being exposed to, there's really not a toll-like receptor signal or a rig-like receptor signal. So it's a very weak response, which biases you to TH2. And because of that, you get the cytokines that are going to tell B cells make IgE, okay? The, e, the IgE is then going to bind to mast cells, can also bind to basophils, but, but I, for the purposes of this class, we're just going to keep it simple and talk about the, the mast cells as the primary mediators. It'll also act on other granulocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, but the main ones here are the mast cells and IgE, okay? And then the second time that you're exposed to this, now you have this, this system where your mast cells are gonna recognize the antigen and degranulate, and they release all the things we just talked about, histamines, leukotrienes, some of the other things that we didn't talk about were the neuropept uh, neuropeptides that stimulate your nervous system to have sneezing. But the, the symptoms that you feel in uh, having an allergy are sort of congestion. Well, that's really the cytokines that are being made as well as some of the small molecules are going to act on goblet cells. Goblet cells are the cells that are producing mucus in both your uh, airways and digestive tract. And so you have increased mucus production and so you get rhinorrhea or a runny nose. Some of the other things that you have are uh, sternutation, which is sneezing. This is really the histamines and leukotrienes and the, as well as the neuropeptides that provide this itching sensation, right? They're stimulating your nerves and, and uh, uh, smooth muscles. And so you have ex expellation or expelling the allergies by sneezing or coughing. Then finally, you have something that, that we separate the congestion from increased produ production of mucus from congestion, which is really swelling of tissues. So one of the things that's being produced is this protein we've talked about before, tumor necrosis factor. The job of TNF is to cause permeability of blood cells by breaking down their cell to tight junctions to allow cells to go from the blood to tissues. And so as, as they do this, as cells are making TNF, then you have increased fluid permeability into tissues, but then the chemokines and uh, other uh, leukotrienes, for example, will attract more cells. And so you're getting inflammation of that site, so swelling of the tissue, and that then leads to difficulty in, in things like breathing, where you can't exchange oxygen. If it's in the digestive tract, you can't exchange nutrients. And so that becomes the, the bigger problem is this inflammation. Dr. Button? So, yes. So if you get exposed to an allergen at a young age, and then years down the line, you get exposed again, are, so are future generations of mast cells still bound to the IgE? Remember, if you have a, the first response, you have long-lived plasma cells that set up shop in your bone marrow and produce antibodies for the rest of your life. And so it's not the original IgE, but there are still cells, cells there making IgE. And yes, they're binding to mast cells. Okay, so what do you need for an allergen? We often talk about this. 
and um, often they're pollens, you know, that are not things that we typically think of as antigens, but they, they actually do have some, some sort of general properties. The first is that most allergens are proteins. And the main reason for that is that it's not sufficient just to get a B cell response, right? If you just had a B cell response, you'd get short-lived primary foci plasma blasts and then would go away. Very similar to what we've talked about for autoimmunity. In order to have a sustained long-lived B cell response so that you'd get long-lived production of IgE, you needed something to, to present to T cells. So they have to have a protein component and it can be the allergen that your B cells recognize as a carbohydrate as long as it's linked to a protein. Now the second thing that you need is, or that is often seen, is that allergens often have proteases. So we don't really think of, of pollens as proteases, but there definitely are. So in, in white birch pollen or ragweed pollen, you have serine and cysteine proteases. In, uh, in If you're from the Middle East or um, the Mediterranean, you, you have expression or exposure to cedar or, or cypress, um, and that's a very common allergen, and there are serine proteases in that. So there, there really are, you know, there usually have protein component, and you, if it does, then it has, often has an, an enzyme with it that allows it to get access to that, past that epithelial burden. Okay, so that's really the key thing. Now there's some other components here. One is that it's actually a very low exposure. Low exposure without really any uh, inflammatory signals, so PAMP receptor signals, favors a Th2 IL-4 uh, produ producing helper response. Okay, so those, those are the three main characteristics. Some of the other ones are that it has to be small. If it's too big, it can't get into the lower respiratory tract, and so it doesn't really you exhale it too quickly to really have it have access. Um, it's often water soluble. That just means so that it can get in through the mucus, which is water based. They're often stable. So the more stable it is, the more likely it is to get past your defenses, that's your mucosal epithelia. And then, of, of, as we said before, they're proteins, and so they have some T cell epitope. Now, typically when we're talking about allergens, we're not talking about injected type one allergens. So those sort of, when we talked about the, you know, different severity type one allergens that are injected are more severe, and they don't have to have those same things because they're being pushed through the epithelium of the skin. So you, you don't have to have an enzyme to get past the mucosal epithelia, for example. It's a much higher dose. And so you can have a different um, it's a fundamentally doesn't have to be all of these properties. So most of the time when we're talking about allergens, we're talking about inhaled allergens that for at least for type one. So for those of you who are, are allergic to dust, you're not allergic to dust in the term of, of dirt. It's actually some of the uh, allergens in dust are derived from the house dust mite. Okay, and that one of the one of those is derp one, or derp one, and this is a potent allergen. Now, it's one; it's a protein. Okay, it has proteolytic activity, so it can get past your epithelia of your, of the lungs, and it is able to do these things and stimulate a Th two response and give you all the things you need for a hypersensitivity reaction. So here we have your respiratory epithelia. DERP1 is inhaled and has enzymatic activity. So it's able to break down the, the tight junctions between cells and get access to that sub epithelial space where you have mast cells. In that space, it's then being taken up by dendritic cells. So you can get a T cell response. And then ultimately, you're going to then make IgE and have a Th2 response that favors that and load these mast cells with IgE against that DERP1 antigen. So the next time that you inhale the dust mite antigens, then you have uh, mast cell degranulation 
and you get an allergic response. Okay, so there's really, this is the sensitization phase and this is the response phase. So why are they so potent? I mean, when we talk about allergies, they can be quite severe. And really it breaks down to that the numbers of, of a molecule can uh, severely outnumber the number of cells. Okay, so if you take ragweed pollen as an allergen, um, in ragweed pollen, there is the RA5 protein. This, is a, this has enzymatic activity, and so it's, a, it's one of the components of the pollen. It's not the only. In one microgram of ragweed pollen is about one nanogram of the RA5 protein. Well, if you go back to chemistry, right, and you calculate based on the molecular weight, that's 10 to the 10th molecules of RA5. Okay, so that's one nanogram you can't even see on a scale. You wouldn't be able to measure that out. It is a really small amount of protein but that's a lot of molecules, okay? Now in your body, you have about three times 10 to the eighth mast cells. In all of your epidermis, you have, uh, and, and in your mucosal epithelia, okay? So you have uh, 300 million mast cells. That's a lot of cells, but when you compare that to the number of molecules of RA5, this invisible amount of ragweed pollen has more than enough to stimulate every skin mast cell in a human. This is why low doses of allergens can have this tremendous physiological response, very potent. So why do we do this? Like why, why is this, why would your immune system be designed to do this? Well, the reality is that uh, type Th2 responses and IgE and mast cells were really designed to combat um, to combat protozoa or helminth infections. So for example, here's the, a river fluke, right, which is a worm. It is that it lays eggs. You, if you're in a country that has that, then you're walking in the water and it can actually enter through the skin, okay? And then it would be great. You make a IgE response to the, against that and your mast cells will degranulate and kill it. And so that's, here's, a, here's a, one of our things. You can see here's one of those surrounded by lots of mast cells as well as, as well as other granulocytes. And that's really what they're designed to do, surround it and kill it. And you can see if you don't have a good response, you can actually get quite severe reactions. You can test for this, looking for anti-worm responses just by pricking the skin with, with the fluke antigens. But well, that's why we have IgE responses and, and Th2 responses. That, uh, that evolutionarily, your immune system had to deal with these kinds of infections. Now, if you think about it, if you get infected with a, with a fluke or a nematode or a worm, you get typically one or a few of those. So it's not like a virus or bacteria where you're getting millions, you're getting one. And so it's a very low dose of antigen. They also are getting access through the skin by having uh, protease activity. So they're breaking down skin junctions to get access into the uh, subepithelial space. So they have a lot of the same properties as the allergens we've just described, which are low dose and have, um, have protease activity to get past those epithelial barriers. Right, so mast cells can be good if you have the right kind of response. Right, so here's our, they're actually showing bacteria, which you can have responses to, but that is getting past the epithelial barrier, just like an allergen would. And then you have activation of mast cells. You have presentation to T cells, and this low dose favors a Th2 response. And you get things like that we've talked about, histamines, leukotrienes, um, you're getting TNF, which further causes blood vessel uh, permeability and recruitment of other cells. And you're getting all of the cytokines that are gonna bias you to having a normal response, okay? Now, do you have to know every mediator here? No, I'm not gonna ask you a 
you know, name every different uh, protein that's made. The main ones are the histamines, the leukotrienes, some of the uh, TH2 cytokines, but it all comes back to IgE on mast cells. Okay, so those are what you need to get a type one hypersensitivity. Okay, now we had this term called atopy. Some people will say atopy, but it's atopy. Um, this is your predisposition, right? So it's both environmental and genetic. Just like when we talked about autoimmunity, there's sort of a trigger and your, pre your predisposition to it. So to get allergies, you have something, you have to have something that has a genetic component and then you get exposed to it. And some of them we've talked about before, right? We talked about the IL-4 receptor. If you have better IL-4 signaling, um, then the IL-4 becomes dominant, the IL-4, which is a TH2 cytokine, becomes dominant over TH1 cytokines. And so that predisposes you to have more IgE. There are other ones though. So if you have mutations in CD14 or, or toll-like receptor four, you actually decrease the TH1 type signal. So you get things like your, you get less of a PAMP signal. And so the, the default is sort of the TH2 pathway. You don't get enough signal to get TH1 cytokines. And so you get, again, a TH2 response. So there are also other things like IL-13, which is um, something that's been known for a while and that's, that results in atopic march, right? When this is where you get, you sort of have one allergy that then leads to another allergy. And so this results in it from increased levels of this protein IL-13. And then when this happens, then you get sort of spreading just much, much like what we talked about um, epitope spreading for autoimmunity, same thing can happen in allergy where high levels of IL-13 will cause you to have consistent or constitutive uh, TH2 responses. Okay, which sort of takes us to something that you may or may not believe. But here's what it's based on. If your TH2 IgE mast cell response is designed to attack helminths, worm infections, then what people have observed is that asthma rates inversely correlate with parasitic worm infection rates. Meaning if the idea is that your immune system is not seeing worms, so it's sitting around and instead tries to make responses to innocuous antigens. And so countries with, with high levels of of uh, sanitation have, have lots of allergic responses. Countries where helminth infections are, are quite common, such as in, in, uh, in Middle Africa or in Southeast Asia, have very little um, allergy responses. And so the idea is that this, this hygiene hypothesis is that if you don't have, um, if you don't have responses to these helminths or worms, then instead your immune system is going to make it to environmental antigens that are not really pathogenic, uh, just because it's, it gets confused. Now, that's not been proven. It is a hypothesis, and so in scientific terms, it, there are some correlation, but it hasn't been proven at all. And so here's sort of a, a different way to look at that: is if you're in sort of developing countries, it favors having these, um, having lots of responses to uh, worms and, and other infections. So there's high helminth burden. This is favored by poor sanitation. Um, typically they have larger family size, you're in more rural settings. And so you have, and, and you also have low antibiotic use. So you really are, are setting it up to have more exposure to these parasitic infections. Whereas in westernized countries, for the most part, we have uh, smaller family size, typically more urban. Uh, we tend definitely use more antibiotics. And then we really don't see these worm infections. Okay, there's, 
some examples, if you go swimming in, in certain lakes, there, there can be infections, but typically the, the sanitation would favor low exposure to worms, okay? And so we would then have, not have these uh, type one hypersensitive responses to worms and instead you make it to pollens. Now the problem with this whole hypothesis is that the mortality rate in developing countries is very high. So how do you know that you just, people don't survive, okay? Whereas in, uh, in westernized countries, you have much lower death rates or much more lower mortality rates. So the people survive and so we get to see allergies. So you could argue it's, it's got nothing to do with the environment. It's in fact has to do with either the genetics of westernized um, peoples or it's got to do with uh, mortality rates and, you, and most of the time you just don't see people surviving if they have an allergy. Okay, so the, this is another version of this that says, well, okay, um, maybe not. Because as we all know, you can draw correlations, but that doesn't mean causation. And so if you look at other things like diabetes, which is, a, is, which is an autoimmune reaction, it also inversely correlates with parasitic worm infection rates. Okay, it's not linked to uh, atopy or parasite infections. It's probably got a lot more to do with diet and, and diagnosis of people that, that have survived and have an allergy. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt. The hygiene hypothesis has been proposed, but it's, it's not proven. So you get, you have a type one hypersensitivity response. What do you do about it? Well, there are treatments for this. And so the first treatment, right, which is in the early 1900s, was by a farmer, uh, Holbrook Curtis. And essentially he got sick of his workers having continued hay fever responses. And so he tried to develop a, a treatment for this. And what he did is that he took hay, fee, or take hay put it in alcohol and made a extract of, of hay or I should say hay extract, not a hay fever extract. And so then he would give this to his, his workers sublingually in the, under the tongue, and that could reduce the symptoms in those patients um, when, when they were exposed to, the, to actual hay pollen or hay particles. Now, the problem with this was that some of those workers developed anaphylaxis and died. And so it's, it's not a great thing if you're killing off your workers. And so then <clears throat> Leonard Noon and John Freeman sort of took up this and then realized that you could eventually, you could start with a low dose and then keep giving higher doses and eventually get desensitized patients. Now, this was really so that they could avoid anaphylaxis. So you slowly escalate this. This is essentially what we still do to desensitize people to allergens. And really this turned around in the mid 1900s um, with Phil Hench and, and Edward Kendall developing corticosteroids. And essentially what corticosteroids can do during an allergic response is inhibit the leukocyte function. Okay, so this is, if you have an acute um, allergy response, you're basically giving them something that's blocking mast cell degranulation. The problem with this, as we all know, is that you can't give corticosteroids for a long time because then you become in, immunosuppressed and susceptible to other infections or to infections. Okay, so there are treatments for type one hyper, hyper, hypersensitivity and they really involve either shutting down the, the uh, immune response, basically stopping the production of IgE by giving a dose from a different route or, or increasing the dose and then suppressing the actual effector mechanisms. So how does this desensitization work? Well, you can sensitize a mouse, right? You can give aerosolized protein. And then when you re-challenge that mouse again with the protein, it'll develop allergic symptoms. But instead of you, what you do is then you start injecting that protein as a vaccine, okay? Where you're giving this uh, systemically you're going to get lots of, uh, you're going to get lots of IL-10 and TGF-beta because what you're doing is promoting regulatory T cell production. 
So the more regulatory cells you have, the more they're able to shut off T cells, prevent IgE from being made, and then redirect that in response to something that might be useful. Now, a key thing here is that you don't get an increase in other Th1 responses. You're not providing uh, innate immune receptor, PAMP receptor signals. And so you're really just providing protein without uh, inflammatory signals. And if you escalate the dose to high levels, then you favor Tregs instead of Th2 cells. Okay, so it's really a dose issue. The high dose will give you a regulatory population that can shut down responses. Now that's great for a long-term treatment, but most of the time when you're having, when you're exposed to an allergen, you don't have that option, right? And so there's acute treatments for allergens are really treating the effector molecules that are released from mast cells. And one of the main ones is histamine, right? Histamine is a small molecule, acts away on your airway epithelium, and does all of these bad things where you have inflammation, congestion, and, and uh, sneezing due to action on, on neurons. So what you give then is a H1 receptor, histamine 1 receptor antagonist. This binds to the receptor that histamines would normally act on, and it blocks them um, from, from activating other cells. Now this is commonly, it's diphenhydramine, right? You normally see this in things like Benadryl and other cough medications or, or uh, symptomatic medications because they were stopping coughing in, in those by much the same way, okay? So there, it's really something that's very common in cold medicine to prevent you from sneezing. Well, it also works in allergies. And there's some newer ones though that actually work quite well. And then one is uh, singular, which should be an either. I don't know why I have a one. But this is kind of the same idea. Instead of inhibiting histamine, you're going to inhibit the leukotrienes. And so this again is binding to the leukotriene receptor and blocking the oxygen, the action of this. There's some others that will block the synthesis of the proteins. These are actually acting on, on the um, enzymes that are creating leukotrienes, but the, that's a different pathway or it's acting on production of the leukotrienes rather than blocking their, their binding to the receptor. Now, one of the things many people who are, have allergies call, will carry around an EpiPen, right? That's a epinephrine or adrenaline, right? This is a, um, Epinephrine is great for um, increasing blood vessel constriction, airway dilation. So you're getting more blood flow and more oxygen exchange, okay? Now it's not really affecting the immune system so much as uh, decreasing the damage that's associated with congestion and with uh, mucus production, where you lose the ability to exchange air, you can't carry it fast enough. This is just opening up your airways and allowing you to carry oxygen better. Okay, so EpiPens work by sort of just making your system better at, at exchanging. Okay, so when you're thinking about type one hypersensitivities, think about when you get an allergic response. It's fast, but it's typically short-lived. You get removed from the environment, you're fine. So if you can survive the initial symptoms, you'll probably be fine. Okay, so it's really just get out of the antigen and, and get somewhere else. So you go from outside to inside, so you don't have as much exposure to pollens. You survive for the symptoms and then and it goes away. The other hypersensitivities are not quite so nice. Okay, so type two hypersensitivities are IgG mediated and they're really IgG and um, other immune cells, okay? So you have some initial exposure. Now, typically type two hypersensitivities are systemic, okay? So you're getting systemic B cell and T cell responses, and they can be quite a lot of antigen. And this is usually seen in blood transfusion. So you get the wrong blood group, you become allergic to that other blood group antigen. It can be antibiotics like penicillin, right? Where it comes in, it modifies proteins, and then you make a B cell and a T cell response to that. 
And the next time then that you get that transfusion or you get penicillin, then you're going to have uh, IgG, IgG, and it's complement, right? IgGs are good at activating complement and as well as other immune cells that are gonna start attacking your own cells. Okay, so you're making, it's really a version of autoimmunity where you've modified yourself cells and then you have IgG to it. And now you, the IgG can bind to those modified antigens and activate complement and um, natural killer cells, for example, that can kill your own cells. Okay, so here's, here's our target cell. There's some modified component on it. You get exposed and you make IgG antibodies against it and you activate the complement cascade. Okay, so this then will give you the membrane attack complex. Those cells will die off, but if those are your respiratory epithelial cells, that's not necessarily a good thing. It also results in more immune activation because remember, activation of complement will give you C3B, and that made, is made to CIC3B. It can be transported to lymph nodes for more antigen responses. Or if it's recognized as C3B, you can have recognition and killing by things like macrophages. Okay, so Ig type one hypersensitivity is IgE and mast cells. IgG is, uh, or sorry, type two hypersensitivities are IgG and complement primarily. Now there's a, another component of this, which is antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Okay, so this is not to the, the complement pathway, but instead here's our target cell. It's got modified versions of, of proteins on them. Those then are bound by IgG. So here's our IgG and it activates things like NK cells. So NK cells will degranulate, they'll make perforin and granzyme and start killing off cells that, that have this modified or foreign antigen. Okay, so the main one here is NK cells, but granulocytes, your neutrophils, eosinophils, and some macrophages can also do it, where they're really just making things that are gonna kill that target cell. So we talked about autoimmunity as, uh, as uh, thyroiditis. This is where you have antibodies that can block the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor and then lead to uh, hypothyroidism. Well, if you think about that, it's really the same thing as a type two hypersensitivity reaction. You have IgG being made, it's blocking the receptor but it also can result in activation of NK cells that can recognize those thyroid cells and kill them. And so that's the antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity part of type two. Looks a whole lot like an autoimmune reaction, but it's instead of just a strictly autoimmune reaction, it's a modified self protein. So we call it a type two hypersensitivity. So you see this in ABO blood group compatibility, right? If you're type O, right, um, the, then you can receive blood only from type O, meaning somebody who has anti-A and anti-B antibodies. If you're type A, you have anti-B antibodies, and so you can receive stuff from, uh, from people that have O or A antigens because you don't have those antigens. And so, Typically what's happening here is in the first transfusion, if you have the wrong blood group, then you generate antibodies against that donor foreign antigen, which is in this case, a glycosylation structure linked to a protein. But now if you get a second transfusion from that donor, you're gonna get rapid recognition and elimination of the foreign red blood cells. That leads to this hyperactivation anaphylactic response and, and death. As I said, one of the more common type two hypersensitivities is penicillin. So what penicillin will do is it can modify um, either bacterial components, or that's what its normal job is, and that then inactivates the bacteria. But it can also modify 
sugars on human blood cells, and that essentially creates a foreign epitope. Okay. And so what's happening then is you're recognizing this modified self antigen as foreign and you generate a response to it. So you have a sensitization against that. The next time you get a, a, a penicillin, it does the same modification and you have a type two hypersensitivity response. So this is the second, right? This is the priming phase where you make a response against that. In the second phase, you already have these pre-existing antibodies. And so what's happening is they're binding to these modified sugars on your erythrocytes and you get activation of complement or antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Okay, so this is really a bad thing because if you lose all of your lymphocytes, then you're going to, uh, you're going to be uh, undergo hematopoietic, or sorry, undergo uh, blood volume decreases and essentially you can't carry oxygen. And so you're, you have a severe acute reaction. Now, a common version of this, or that is, is seen sort of naturally, are the RH antigens. And there are a number of these, but uh, the rho antigen D is the main one. And so the problem comes if you have a mother that is RH negative and has a, uh, the father of the, of the fetus is RH positive, then the fetus will be RH positive. And during pregnancy, or during delivery, the mother then is exposed to the RH antigen and generates antibodies to it, which is fine for the firstborn because you know, the, the baby comes out and it's fine. So the second oldest has the problem because now the mother has pre-existing uh, IgG antibodies against the RH antigen, and those can actually cross the placenta and attack the fetus during the second pregnancy. Okay, so this is, erythroblastosis fatalis. This is something that you have to be aware of if you're having more than one child. So what do you do about it? Well, you just, um, you're just injecting an antibody against the RHD antigen. Okay, so really, here's the sort of the first pregnancy, you generate RH specific B cells. Those are then circulating. If the, the second pregnancy, then those antibodies can attack red blood cells and and develop this disease. Now, instead, what people will do, right, is that your doctor will will test the the uh, mother and father, and determine if the mother has this potential for for developing Rh specific antibodies. If the if the mother does, then they will treat with Rogram. Rogram is just an antibody against the Rhd antigen, and you're preventing the mother from making a response. Those antibodies eventually go away, and, but they've presented B, prevented B cell activation and formation of, of uh, long-lived plasma cells, okay? So it's really injecting an antibody to prevent the mother generating an antibody response. Okay, so type one hypersensitivity, it's IgE in mast cells. Type two hypersensitivity is IgG in complement or antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. It can be from macrophages or natural killer cells, any number of cells can do it. But the main thing is complement and ADCC. Now, when we're talking about type three hypersensitivities, these are where you have lots, large immune complexes forming. And it's sort of a hybrid between the, the type one and type two. Okay, so you have some antigen is delivered and you make an antibody response. Typically, it's an IgG response. <clears throat> now what's happening though, is that then you have, um, you have large complexes forming of IgG and antigen. And this then will activate the, will bind to FC gamma receptors on mast cells, okay? And those will activate the mast cells to degranulate. Now, part of this is it's, it's binding from, part, from the antibody um, FC portion, but IgG, again, is going to activate complement. So the combination of complement and uh, FC gamma receptor binding 
activates the mast cell. So what happens, you get uh, local inflammation, but essentially you're activating mast cells to get all of the type one hypersensitivity responses. But because it's systemic with IgG, you're getting type two hypersensitivity responses as well. And this will result in the main symptom of, of this kind of response is loss of tissue function. So for example, you get inflammation or which we often say is congestion or, or uh, tissue swelling. You're getting activation of platelets. And so you get blood clotting and that results in occlusion of blood. And so that can lead to organ loss or loss of function of an organ. So <clears throat> the outcome of type three hypersensitivities can be a little different depending on where these antibodies are accumulating. Okay, so if it's intravenous, depending on where the, the antibodies are accumulating, you can have vasculitis, okay, where it's just causing this in, in all of your blood vessels. If they're accumulating in the kidneys, then you get nephritis. And if they're accumulating in joints, you'll get arthritis. Now we have already said arthritis is an autoimmune disease, but if it's due to some exposure, then you have arthritis due to an environmental antigen. As again, as we said previously, if it's subcutaneous, then you get this localized swelling and you can get an arthritis reaction, but it can be inhaled. So if farmer's lung is a type three hypersensitivity response that is due to high doses of antigen. And we'll go through a couple examples. So as I said, farmer's lung is, was often seen in people who are exposed to high levels of pollens or hay. And so they would get a large dose of this. And it would essentially convert a type one response to a type three response. In reality, you, get, you can get both of them occurring at the same time. The higher doses of antigen and repeated exposure favor a Th1 type response and type three hypersensitivity. The lower dose and infrequent exposure would favor a Th2 response and a type one hypersensitivity. Okay, so you get lots of antigen inhaled in the lungs, you generate IgG, but because there's so much antigen, you get these large complexes of antibody antigen. And that then can bind to FC gamma receptors on uh, particularly on your mast cells to activate this allergic response. Okay, so the effector mechanisms are the same as, as type one and type two, except that they're sort of combined. Okay, so it, it can activate complement, it can activate mast cells, and it can activate antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. The main difference is that there's a large amount of antigen that is making these, these uh, immune complexes. And because FC gamma receptors have low affinity, you need large complexes to get activation of those cells. So that's farmer's lung glomerular nephritis is also a type two, uh, three hypersensitivity. And this can often result from either as uh, we don't think of the hypersensitivity as autoimmune reactions, but it can be. If you have chronic infections or chronic drug use, so exposure to some metals, even tumors can result in production of systemic IgG. And then if there's a lot of antigen there, these will form immune complexes and these can't be cleared by the kidneys, they can become deposited in the glomerulus. And then this activates this type three hypersensitivity response and you get kidney shutdown, okay? So you can have loss of kidney function. If that happens, you typically don't survive without treatment. Okay, so type one, IgE and mast cells. Type two, IgG and, and uh, complement and ADCC. Type three, it's IgG, mast cells, complement, and ADCC, sort of a combination of one and two at a higher dose. Type four is cellular. It's not antibody mediated, right? And so these are delayed type hypersensitivity or type four. And this is you prime a CD4 response to some foreign antigen, you get memory cells there. And then the next exposure, it requires a few days to actually get, activate those T cells. 
go to the site of infection and, and start doing what the, the hypersensitivity response. That really is where the delay comes from. It takes some time. Now, it's similar to type three, but it's not antibody mediated. It's T cell recognition of antigen. Um, and it, this then favors, um, rather than ADCC from antibodies, it's T cells getting into tissues, promoting inflammation and all the same kinds of responses, but it's not antibody mediated. It's the main difference. So when we're talking about this, it's actually just a normal immune response, right? Let's say there's a sensitization phase. For example, if you have, um, we'd say during a bacterial infection, right? You get presentation of antigen to T helper cells. You get a TH1 response and that really, that's what you need to control that infection. In the effector phase or the sort of second part of this, those T cells then, are going to go out and they're going to make all of those things that they normally should make. T cell growth factor. They're going to make interferon gamma, T tumor necrosis factor. This then will activate other immune cells, including macrophages, and then they can go out and cause more inflammation and, and tissue destruction. <clears throat> so what are the effector molecules here? They're a little bit different than what we've talked about so far. So far we talked about TH2 responses and um, things that are going to increase permeability. You get some of the same things, right? You get chemokines being produced by these T helper cells that attracts other uh, leukocytes and macrophages. You get TH1 type cytokines, so interferon gamma and TNF, which are causing local inflammation, activating uh, your innate immune cells like macrophages. It is causing tissue uh, remodeling where, so there's better access. And then it's also causing increased production of things. Things like granul granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor. This means you're activating and producing more uh, innate cells. So here's some examples of of T, uh, type four hypersensitivities. So there are things like um, some insect venoms. As we discussed before, you can have a DTH response to mycobacterial proteins. And that is mostly localized, right? So if you get stung, you can have a localized erythema, you can have um, sort of dermatitis or a localized response. That's not such a bad thing. It's not, it's not typically life-threatening. Um, although insect venoms, particularly bee stings, can be. But there are also things like um, contact hypersensitivities. And these are really things that are, are modifying proteins. And then those are seen differently than by, by T cells. And there's all, it's very similar to what's happening with penicillin. Penicillin is, mar is changing carbohydrate structures that then allows those antigens to be recognized by B cells. Well, some of the other contact hypersensitivity uh, reactions are modifying the, the epitopes that are seen by T cells. And so you get a T cell response to them. And so things like poison ivy has penadecatechol, which is a, a protein modifier. And so you're essentially changing the T cell epitopes. Okay, it can be things like Exposure to high levels of nickel or chromate. These are going to modify proteins to, uh, to have different peptide sequences. And so they're seen by T cells. Now this can cause quite severe disease. People with nickel allergies that come into contact with nickel will have a severe uh, reaction and can also result in some things like blood flow occlusion. Now we've all heard sort of about gluten allergies, right? And although many people do not actually have these, there is, there is a real gluten allergy. It's just called celiac disease. And so in this case, you're taking in an allergen, right? That then is going to activate your T cells and you have, because you're constantly making uh, immune responses to environmental food allergies or food antigens, 
then you're going to have T cell responses against this food allergen. And then the next time you take it in, you're going to have inflammation due to T cells in the intestinal tract. So here's a tuberculin skin test, right? We typically think of this as a, a TH2 kind of response, but it also can, the DTH part of that, right, is, is this delayed response to the antigen. So when you do a tuberculin skin test, if you've been previously exposed to mycobacteria, excuse me, if you inject it, you'll get an immediate response. That's the type two hypersensitivity where you've, you've got uh, IgG antibodies and they're making an immediate response to it. But what they actually do is have you come back after three days and see if you still have a response. If you do, that means you have a type four hypersensitivity response to the mycobacterial tuberculosis infection. Okay, so you, you're getting reactivation of those memory Th1 cells, and then you're getting inflammation days later rather than immediate. Now, this is not really an allergy. It's just the normal response to infection, but now you're testing if there's a pre-existing response. As I said, there's, there are other contact dermatitis is a different version of this where you're having molecules from, uh, from poisonous plants and those are gonna modify your um, skin proteins, okay? And so once that does that, then you can sensitize against that skin protein, which is essentially now being seen as something foreign and the, the subsequent exposure you'll have a one to two day response time to poison ivy. So this is seen um, in people who, who have contact with poison ivy, they'll have an immediate reaction, but then two days later, they'll show up at the hospital because they're having a DTH reaction, okay? It's also seen if you've gotten too many henna, henna tattoos, right? Where you can develop contact dermatitis because henna contains these, uh, these molecules, which are modifying cells and getting inflammation, which is sort of the whole point of it. Now, food allergies are, are similar, but what's happening here is that you're getting, um, you're getting modification, okay? That it's actually, uh, you have enzymes that are predisposing you to this, which are going to modify glutamates to uh, or sorry, uh, glutamine to glutamic acid. So it's just a deamination. <clears throat> and so in that case, when you do that, you're actually making, generating something that your immune system can see. And so then you get activation of T cells. And the next time you eat bread, which still has the gluten in it, then you'll make a T cell response um, that causes localized inflammation. Now, again, what you have is you often have combinations of these. So type three hypersensitivities, you're having lots of IgG and um, antibodies against gluten and combined with a T cell response against the gluten. So you have type three and type four. Okay, but in reality, we're, we're separating them to just keep them as, as into one bucket here. Okay, so the last thing is, is the bonus question which will be due on Tuesday. If you go to some naturopathic um, magazines or publications, if you go back to the, the back of it and look for ads, you can buy hookworms, which is a helmet. And the idea is that you're going to buy them and infect yourself with them in an in a attempt to either prevent or cure an allergy. And this is really based on maybe not a complete understanding, but at least it's based on the hygiene hypothesis that you're redirecting the immune response against, uh, away from environmental antigens and towards the hookworm that you're ingesting and infecting yourself with. Now, the question is, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing? Would this be based on your immunology? Do you think that this would work? And if it does, why? Okay. And with that, I'll stop and take questions. So the first question is, what does ADCC stand for? It's antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Correct. Okay. Let me see that somebody answered that. 
have I have a question. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. You go ahead first. <laughs> okay. I just have a quick question. For someone that um, didn't show any uh, allergy to the food, to any food, for example, the nuts, but suddenly it shows uh, the very severe allergy. So it might be because of the environment changes or other disease that might be has or and they don't know. Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, your, as your environment changes, your atopy changes too, or your predisposition changes. Mm -hmm. So this is often seen in people who uh, immigrate to a new country mm -hmm. and their diet changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. They'll often start, start developing food allergies because you have an entirely different environment. Yeah. And again, if you move from uh, somewhere you know, that is different environmentally, you no longer get exposed to those pollens, but you get exposed to new ones and you can develop mm -hmm. new allergies to those. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah, my question was about um, the food allergies as well. Mm -hmm. So my little sister has celiac disease and my mom has done a bit of research on it. And she's saying that there's like some research suggesting that like genetically modified wheat um, like is causing an increased amount of people with celiac disease compared to like historical amounts of people with celiac disease? I, could that I, be like a new antigen? Well, potentially it could be, but in reality, I think our diets are, are very different. And so it's not just that it's genetically modified, for that to occur, you would have to make the argument that it is a new antigen. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's much easier to say, well, we've increased, we've increased our gluten intake a whole lot, and so you're likely to see those. Mm -hmm. um, immunologically, I doubt that it's a new antigen. Okay. Potentially, you know, could be if they're uh, expressing different enzyme enzymes. So is the, the cause of celiac disease is because the person has the genetic predisposition to that enzyme? It can be, right? This is, that's part of atopy is mm -hmm. you have to have the genetic predisp predisposition to, to develop that. Many people eat bread and never have a problem with it. Okay? Mm -hmm. But some people, for example, if you have this predisposition for um, modifying uh, pre the peptides that you get T cell responses, Mm -hmm. you overexpress that, then yeah, you can have this predisposition due to increased modification of it. There are other factors besides just that enzyme mm -hmm. though, right? There are um, levels of intake. There are, mm -hmm. can be environmental triggers, for example, having a infection at the same time as being exposed to that. Mm -hmm. And as well as the cytokines that are, if you have more or less of particular cytokines, that then also predisposes you. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's kind of interesting because she wasn't diagnosed until she was like in, in third and maybe second or third grade. And she never had a problem with eating gluten before then. So what would, tr would it be that she'd always had it and we just never knew, or was it something that environmentally could have triggered? The well, there's, disease? there's two arguments. One is that allergies get worse with, with continued exposure. Mm -hmm. And so it may have been that just was not that big a deal. Like she had it earlier, but it wasn't severe enough to really cause a problem. And so it was never, wasn't diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So that's one argument. The second would be that every time you're taking in bread, you're sort of rolling the dice. If you have high atopy or predisposition to develop uh, hypersensitivity, every time you're taking a chance and then eventually yeah. it would happen. There's really no way of, of telling the difference between those two scenarios. Mm -hmm. In fact, it might have been both. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's, it's just interesting that disease is kind of, it's kind of interesting to look at. Okay, any other questions? Okay, there's no more questions. I will see you all on Tuesday.